So welcome to the Wednesday weekly webinar. Uh, my name is Julie Garden Robinson, and I will be doing part of this session today along with Dr. Clifford Hall, who's a professor in plant sciences. But first, I have a couple of things I'd like to share. Um, our last webinar of this particular series is next week, same time, same place. And it's called Growing Microgreens in Your Home. And that will be led by Esther McGinnis, who is an assistant professor and horticulturist in plant sciences here on campus at NDSU. So that should be a really fun one to hear because um, it's becoming such a popular topic. Uh, just a couple of logistics. I think everyone's figured this out. <laughs> but that's the screen that you're seeing probably in your home or wherever you are. You can type your questions in the chat pod. And uh, I don't think we're going to be using any videos today. But we will try to answer the questions as we go. And if we miss it, Cliff and I will kind of track questions for the other person. And we'll certainly try to answer them all before we finish up in the next hour. Uh, we will have, again, a short survey at the end of the webinar. And I really ask that you take this because um, we are funded by a grant. And I write the reports. And I always have to give some feedback to the grant agency. So we will email you that link. And I also want to draw your attention to the Field to Fork website. You're always adding new resources to that. So if you're a food entrepreneur, we have an entrepreneurship website that's very complete. We also have a local foods website and then a dedicated website to this project that has many fact sheets. And you're certainly welcome to print and distribute. If you're at a farmer's market or selling things, you can print anything you like from our website and use it. You don't have to get special permission. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Hall. And he and I are working together right now, actually, starting a new fermentation project. So that's kind of exciting. So thanks, Cliff, for joining us. And I'll have you tell them more about yourself, if you'd like. OK. Well, I am a professor in the Department of Plant Sciences. Um, my education is actually food science. And so uh, much of my teaching deals with food science. Um, I, I do a lot of food processing activities with Julie um, and also uh, work with other instructors in our product development course at, at uh, NDSU for our food science kids. And that's always fun to watch them develop food products. So I, I basically have a teaching research appointment. And also, I uh, I'm in charge of the pulse quality uh, program at NDSU in terms of the end use aspect of that. And so uh, fermentation um, is of interest to us with regards to using pulses. So um, with that, I think I will get started with our focus today. Uh, really, this particular presentation uh, we'll focus on just some generic information about food fermentation. It it's serves as a really an introduction to this topic. Uh, recognizing that a, a few weeks ago, I covered uh, some of the same information. So again, I'll try not to bore you too much with, with some of the details. But we'll start off with a, a history. Uh, we'll define uh, what fermented foods are show a few types or give a, a few examples, uh, highlight the fermentation process, and then uh, talk about potential health benefits uh, of fermented foods. Uh, fermented foods actually, for the longest time, were not really thought of as necessarily healthy foods. But I think there's a lot more evidence that we have today showing that there's a lot of health benefits. So Julie will, will cover that aspect of the presentation. So if we look at then the history, um, with, with history, I kind of group it into three different types of history. The first is um, oral histories. These are history that are passed down from generation to generation. Uh, and it, it's not really necessarily written anywhere. So it's just kind of this verbal passing on of, of information. Um, for some of us, this might include a recipe, for example, where 
your grandmother knew this recipe and she never wrote it down, she passed it on to your, your, your mother or father and then they pass it on to you. And so that's kind of that oral history. The second type of, of history would be based on this archaeological data, uh, finding proof in, in a, a, a dish that was uncovered uh, when they were digging in runes of, of some sort, uh, where you actually find pieces of food items or they can use uh, DNA technologies or, or genetic type of, of information to kind of track some of that materials that may have been present in these these uh, dishes or plates or, or um, dumps or garbage areas of a, a lost civilization. Uh, and then the, the last one is um, basically a history that is inferred. I call this an inferred history, meaning that they have evidence that uh, for example, um, the nomadic tribes in Asia used to carry water in in the a dried calf stomach um, or leather pouches, and they used to use that as a way to carry their water from one location to another. Um, some of the the first lessons we learn when we talk about food fermentation is is that food fermentation happened by accident, and they always use this this nomadic tribe as that that kind of that uh, example, meaning that they say, well, yogurt or cheese came about by these nomadic tribes carrying their milk in a, a calf's stomach. And so in that particular case, there's no direct evidence that they actually carried milk in these bags, okay? But there is evidence that they used them as maybe a something to carry uh, water or other similar beverages. And so we infer that you know, they probably or they, they may have carried milk. And if they did, then there was likely that some of the uh, enzymes in the uh, calf's stomach were still active once it was rehydrated. And so um, we kind of then make that assumption then that, well, that's maybe where fermentation started with regards to dairy products. Again, we don't have any archaeological data to support that. Um, but we do have archaeological data that dates back to 6000 BC where they've looked at fermented beverages in, in wines and, and uh, fermented cereals. So we have some archaeological data. Did it happen probably before 6000 BC? More than likely, yes. We just haven't found the archaeological data yet to, to show that. Um, what's important to understand is that nearly every culture, you know, has fermented foods today. So from a hist historical perspective today, we find that almost every culture has a fermented food item that might be unique just to their country or to their region. Um, and so our assumption is, is that historically other cultures or other uh, peoples also had fermented products. Um, why do we still like our, our fermented products? Well, they have unique flavors. Um, a sourdough bread in, from San Francisco tastes different than a sourdough bread that maybe was produced in Turkey. Uh, so there's unique flavors associated with these types of products. Even though we say sourdough bread, they may have different flavors. Um, also tradition. Um, when we, we highlight traditions, I think most of you can think of a family tradition, um, and if, if cultured products are part of that tradition, they're probably passed down from one generation to the next. So again, tradition is, is a very important part of that, that reason for continued use of fermented foods. Well, I think most of you will recognize what are fermented foods, and of course, beer and wine come to mind for many people, and I've already talked about sourdough breads, uh, but one thing that you may not think about would be olives. Uh, my first encounter of a fermented olive was when I visited Turkey back in about 2005, and that was the first time I've ever consumed uh, a fermented olive. Um, of course, many of you probably consume 
uh, yogurt on a daily basis. So again, these are products that many of us um, would associate with a, a fermented uh, food. Of course, sauerkraut uh, is another one. Uh, kimchi, very similar, but, but a spicy version of sauerkraut. Um, it's kind of more of a, a vegetable, a fermented vegetable product. Uh, but then we get into the, the, the soy-based uh, fermented foods. Uh, just at lunch today, we were talking about natto and, and how uh, no one in the room could stand to eat natto. Uh, so even our Chinese uh, faculty said they wouldn't touch it. And so, so it's a case where certain cultures, natto is a, a great product. And they, they really like it, but for others, maybe not. And so uh, keep in mind that with these fermented products, that it's, it's not necessarily going to be universal in the consumption. So it's going to be very much dependent maybe on that, that culture, that tradition uh, in, in the consumption of these products. So let's move into the, the, the fermentation definitions. Um, I've highlighted four definitions for you. Uh, with fermenta uh, fermentation, uh, there's, there's what we call a true fermentation and then just fermentation in general. And I will kind of differentiate those for you by the end of our, our time through these definitions. But what I want you to recognize is there's a lot of similarities in these definitions. The, the first definition indicates to us that this is a process, okay? So you're actually making a, a processed food. So I want you to think about processed foods and, and in recent years processed foods have been looked at in a negative light. Um, but I want you to understand also that a fermentation is a processing method. So if you're eating sauerkraut, um, you're eating a processed food. So it's important to, to just recognize that processing is, is not necessarily a bad thing. And so I think we need to stop using it in that context that it's, it's bad. So in this particular case, process, uh, the, the fermentation is a process and it involves this breakdown of organic substances. So it's going to break down organic substances into just generically simpler substances. So that's a very vague or very general definition here. But if we look at this in the context of what happens, oftentimes sugars are that substrate that we break down. So sugars are broken down into things such as alcohol. So that's a good example of a, a definition that, that talks about it, it being a process. It, it, highlights the, the organic substances that are breaking down into uh, smaller compounds. And the last part of this definition that's very important is this concept of anaerobic. So it's this anaerobic breakdown that occurs. So, so keep that word in mind because I'm going to use it throughout the next three definitions. In the second definition, we again have this anaerobic breakdown and it is of energy rich compounds and, and most often these compounds are carbohydrates. Uh, but be aware that you can also have a protein. So a protein can also be an energy rich compound. So we have, have those two components typically. Um, in this particular case, again, the carbohydrate is broken down into carbon dioxide, alcohol, um, or organic acid. So you have specifics here. Um, with that, that really coincide with that earlier definition. The uh, third definition here um, involves now chemical reactions, so they highlight chemical reactions. Uh, but this time, what's unique about this is they really stress microorganisms. And, and, and for a lot of our fermented foods, the ferment, fermented foods is based on this concept of microorganisms. So we're using microorganisms to convert this um, organic substrate. So we have this organic substrate and we make it into that simple substance. So it's, again, think of this as using microorganisms. And again, with this definition, we're talking about sugar being broken into simpler compounds. In this particular uh, case, uh, I want you to, to recognize that 
they once again use anaerobic uh, as part of that definition. The final definition, um, again, says it's an anaerobic cellular process where organic foods, and, and really this shouldn't say necessarily organic food, but organic substrates like carbohydrate or protein are converted into simpler compounds. So that's typically what we have here. And so with all four definitions, the, the word anaerobic has been repeated in every definition. And uh, when we talk about a fermentation, a true fermentation is one that is done under an anaerobic environment. Uh, so that's the, the, what a true fermentation is. However, a lot of people just use fermentation as a general word to, to highlight a, a number of different things, such as production of vinegar. So when you make vinegar, you are creating acetic acid, and that acetic acid is this metabolite that has preservative action. Uh, but when we talk about vinegar production, vinegar production is a two-step process where you have a true, true um, fermentation occurring first where you're producing the alcohol. Once this alcohol is formed, it's then transformed under an aerobic condition uh, to uh, vinegar, all right? So keep in mind that, that a, a true fermentation is one that's done anaerobically. And so when you are uh, doing a, a fermentation at home, you oftentimes use a, a fermentation lock. And a fermentation lock is, is something that has a little bit of water, and then you see bubbles coming up through that water. The, those bubbles are carbon dioxide. And so carbon dioxide is a common byproduct of this uh, process of anaerobic fermentation. So you know that your fermentation is occurring if you see these bubbles, okay? So that's a, a good sign that, that something's happening. Um, but recognizing also that um, in a fermentation that, such as vinegar, um, people associate that with a, a, a true fermentation, but it really is kind of that two-step process. So be able to differentiate that, and if, if ever asked by a client, well, I tried to ferment a certain product and it tastes like vinegar, um, so my wine didn't necessarily work, uh, that would be a question to ask them. You know, did you really do this under an anaerobic condition? Um, did you, when you had a fermentation lock, did you see bubbles coming through and so forth? So some things to remember about fermentation is that fermentations are not sterilization methods. I think for those of you who eat yogurt, you're eating live bacteria as part of that. So you know that, that it's not a sterile environment. We want those bacteria. Uh, so oftentimes when you have a fermented product, you have to do some sort of processing after it's, it's gone through its, its uh, fermentation period to help prolong its life. So with sauerkraut, for example, there's a number of, of different things you can do, but one of those is to can it. And, and by canning it in jars, it's a sterilization method. So recognizing that, that since this is not a sterilization method, you might need to process it in some other fashion. Uh, fermentation is, is really a method that preserves food using microorganisms. So that's the key again, this word microorganisms. We mentioned that earlier. Um, with, with microorganisms, there's two ways in which the food is preserved. The first here is that the, the microorganisms of interest will compete with other organisms. So if you have a foodborne pathogen, that specific organism you don't really necessarily want in that, that product, all right? So as a result, um, you hope that that good microorganism will outcompete that bad one. And so that's kind of one way that microorganisms help preserve that product. The other way is that the, the organisms that we want in the fermentation process, they create metabolites. I mentioned alcohol before. So alcohol is a preservative. And so in this particular case, these metabolites will kill 
some of the other microorganisms in that system. So that's a good thing. Uh, so those are essentially how fermentation acts to preserve uh, uh, food uh, products. Uh, just to wrap up the definition part of our discussion here, uh, remember that fermentation is a transformation of nutrients. Um, this nutrients typically being uh, carbohydrate or protein. Uh, this is done by bacteria or other microorganisms, which we'll see uh, shortly here, and enzymes that are produced by bacteria or other organisms are part of this transformation process. So again, our, our definition focuses on this transformation of, of a material. The microorganisms that are used or involved in the fermentation are grouped into three different areas or categories. We have bacteria and yeast. Uh, bacteria and yeast are the ones that are responsible for the true fermentation processes. Remember I said that true fermentation is, is a, a fermentation done under anaerobic conditions. So bacteria and yeast, they can, um, or they are responsible for these true fermentations. Molds, in contrast to that, molds require oxygen to survive. And so um, they never are responsible for a true fermentation. They are oftentimes secondary processes that occur in a fermentation process. Uh, one good example is, you, is this uh, demonstrated in this picture where they have a blue cheese. In this particular scenario, the, there's a, a fermentation that initially occurred where the bacteria created lactic acid. The lactic acid caused the proteins in milk to coagulate. And after the cheese master has formed that into a shape, they inject mold into it. And so now this mold is, is considered part of this fermentation process. Um, but what this mold actually does then is it degrades the, the protein. So it degrades the protein. So instead of having this rubbery cheese, it becomes dry and brittle and kind of cracks and breaks. Um, it also then um, develops some flavors. Uh, so it's not necessarily a true fermentation, but that process that it um, undergoes is beneficial in that it helps develop good flavors. It helps to, to make that cheese have a different type of structure. Uh, so just recognizing then when we talk about bacteria, yeasts, and molds as microorganisms in, in, in fermentations, it's really the bacteria and the yeast that are the true, are, that are responsible for the true fermentation. Uh, with bacteria, the most common being the lactobacilli. Um, or simply lactic acid bacteria. And then with yeast, um, Saccharomyces cerevisiae is, is probably one of the more common ones, but you would have similar yeast that, that would do that fermentation. If we look at some of the fermentation uh, types, lactic acid fermentations are probably the most common. Uh, these are the where we use bacteria. So the lactic acid bacteria, those are the ones that convert the sugars into lactic acid. This lactic acid then serves as a preservative. So again, we're preserving that food based on the formation of this metabolite. The second type would be this alcoholic fermentation. Uh, again, this is where we convert sugars into alcohol. And this alcohol then serves as this uh, preservative. So. Um, Remember, lactic acid fermentations produce lactic acid. Alcoholic fermentations produce alcohol. So that's the price that we get from these types of fermentation. Keep in mind that in both of these systems, we have other chemical reactions that result um, during this process, and it allows us to develop flavor characteristics of the different foods. So there's other reactions that are happening um, than just simply this conversion process. So again, it's, it's uh, 
very much dependent on what organism specifically you are using, whether or not you develop certain unique flavor characteristics. Some other important basic uh, information about fermentation is that, remember, the growth of microorganisms is really the primary goal. We want to have those lactic acid bacteria outproducing the, or outgrowing other microorganisms in that system. So we want to enhance that microbial growth. Uh, lactic acid is, is produced with uh, fermented vegetables and milk. So a lot of the, the lactic acid fermentation processes would be vegetable-based products or milk, kefir, um, yogurts, uh, cheeses. So these are all um, fermentations that are done in milk, but it's really the lactic acid um, that is driving the formation of that curd structure in, in, in milk-based products. Uh, but again, the lactic acid bacteria are the ones that we typically add to the milk to get that to produce that fermented product. With fruit, uh, when we look at fruits, they produce alcohol. So uh, alcohol is a primary product if you do a fermentation of, a, of a, say, a fruit juice, um, wine being the example. Uh, but if you also look at cereal products, uh, with cereal products, we can have the production of alcohol as well. Um, a, a secondary product that might form would be acetic acid, but remember with acetic acid, it's oftentimes involved in that oxidation part of a fermentation system. So it's not necessarily the, tr the true oxidation process. Uh, so when we, when we uh, um, essentially uh, look at these fermentation products, again, recognizing that we try to use organisms to complement what, what we want. So I see that we have a, uh, a question about uh, diseased uh, cabbage. And um, it's important with, with disease products um, that you, you try to get rid of as much of the dead product as you can. So if it's rotten on one side of the cabbage and the other side looks good, if you're in desperation, you, you could probably use that. Preference would be not to use it. Because part of it is is that you don't know what how those organisms are going to try to compete with, say, the lactic acid bacteria. So you don't know how they're going to compete. So in the end, you may not produce sufficient lactic acid to really destroy that that black rot bacteria. Um, has it? You know, I don't really know if it's been investigated, but that seems like a, uh, maybe a good project to think about, um, looking at what happens. But, but my suggestion would be is not to use necessarily that cabbage that would be diseased in that fashion. And I think that would be a good conversation to have even at the end of our, our presentation when we talk about uh, sauerkraut fermentation. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Julie, and she is going to then cover the, the benefits of fermentation. And maybe if she wants to comment on this, this cabbage issue of black rot, um, she can maybe do that before she even gets into her part of it. All right. With that, Julie, so we had a bit of a over. conversation about black rot and also black end rot on tomatoes, which seems to be an issue this year. And the consensus of the horticulture specialist actually a couple of them, was uh, the same thing you said. We don't really have the answers to know that those would be safe to preserve. So it's best to preserve the best and uh, eat the rest. <laughs> I think that's the usual, usual thing. But certainly could be a topic of investigation because you don't know what's persisting throughout that fruit or vegetable. So some benefits of fermentation. Certainly, Cliff has been talking about preservation. They'll last a lot longer. The more acidic foods are, the longer they last. I'm going to talk a little bit more in depth about health benefits, because one of my roles here at NDSU is as a nutrition and health specialist. 
Uh, we'll mention ener or I will mention energy efficiency, and then we'll talk a little bit more about flavor. Certainly, fermenting does lend lend itself to all sorts of flavor development. So some benefits of preservation in general are improved food safety, but I'll add to that you need to follow the, the rules that have been established through research. I've been getting a lot of preservation questions lately myself about some unusual preservation methods um, using equipment that really was never intended to preserve. Um, for example, one fad right now, so for all of you listening, I want you to be going out and telling your friends not to do this. Uh, people are canning foods in their oven instead of in a pressure canner or in a water bath canner. Uh, it is not safe to can food in your oven, to put it on a tray, set it in the oven, because it does not, that food does not reach a safe internal temperature. And it's just the way that heat penetration works. And there's some devices advertised on TV. If you're an insomniac some night and you turn on the TV, like I was the other night, and I saw these really interesting devices. One was about canning. Um, you could pressure cook, pressure can. You could do anything in this device. And they even said it was USDA tested. And actually, the USDA Center for Home Food Preservation came out with a statement that, no, we did not test this device. Uh, so you really need to be looking into uh, what information sources that you use. And certainly now that it's food preservation season for a lot of our, our fall vegetables, follow those rules. We have them free on our website. All extension um, agencies across the United States also have food preservation resources. So you know, remember that food safety is probably a primary concern right along with nutrition, but first it has to be safe <laughs> before you eat it. OK, so with preservation and particularly fermentation, it can help contribute to the food needs of the world. And in fact, you can even take some waste products, and through the process of fermentation, you can make them into edible food products. So they've looked at even locusts and fruit peels and hides and bones, for example. Probably not things that we typically eat in this part of the world, but the research has been done to show that maybe that is a future food source as well. One thing that happens with fermentation is that the nutrition, or the nutrients in particular, um, are more bioavailable. And that is, that is definitely true. We also see some improvements in digestive and immune health as a result of fermentation. And fermentation can, eating fermented foods can also influence the microbial balance in our GI tract and can even remove some anti-nutritional factors. OK, and I see I have a couple questions. So I'm going to pause for a second. And Ann says, I've had several consumers this 2016 season doing or asking about oven canning. And this is new to my question. Yes, um, not safe. The jars might break. And also, we, we don't get proper heat penetration, as I mentioned. Um, people flipping jars upside down to seal instead of a canner. Um, really, the best way to do it is use the two-piece lids. Never paraffin, because that doesn't fully seal the jams and jellies. And process for five to 10 minutes in a water bath canner. That's, that's the rules. I've had people call me and tell me through the years, as I've been in this role for almost 20 years, tell me that jars have blown up in their cupboards. And a lot of times, it happens to be jams and jellies that were not heat processed, because there can be bacteria, other organisms in the jars that can produce enough gas to blow the jars apart. And that, I've heard about that in tomatoes uh, and other things as well. So thanks for those questions. and. I will go back to fermentation. So lots of potential health benefits. So I have a little question for all of you. Um, how many bacteria do you think reside in our body? You can type your answer in the chat box. What do you think? 
you are correct. A hundred trillion. And I can't even imagine really what a billion looks like and much less a trillion. But we have a lot of bacteria and we want them to be there because they do play a role in our health and in fighting other organisms that can get inside of us. So if we weighed all the bacteria, how much would it weigh? Two to three pounds, five to six, or ten to eleven? You can type in your, your answer in the chat box again. Well, if you said two to three, or if you were thinking two to three pounds, that is the correct answer. It'd be nice to think that all you need to do is lose your bacteria and you drop ten pounds, but that wouldn't work. So it's about a couple pounds all the bacteria would, would weigh if we were able to, to weigh them. So what do these gut bacteria do for us? They break down nutrients, so they help us digest our food. They also can produce certain vitamins. Um, vitamin K, for example, which is involved in blood clotting, is part of uh, bacterial um, production in our body. They can help regulate energy and also energy storage. They're competitors with these pathogens or these disease-causing organisms. And they can also help us with our immune responses. So sometimes bacteria is good. And sometimes we wanted to keep it away from us. But in this case, our gut bacteria, we need to keep them at a particular balance. And that's why a lot of nutrition experts are recommending the regular intake of probiotics to foods like yogurt on a daily basis, or a regular basis at least. So now a few definitions. Um, raise your hand if you've ever heard the word probiotic prior to today. Yes, that's a popular one. We hear more and more about it. What does it mean? Well, if we split the word in half, pro means for, bio means life. So it is for life. It, it injures, our Probiotics introduce a bacterium into the body that provides health benefits to the host. And there are several natural sources, including yogurt, sour cream, buttermilk, kefir, uh, sauerkraut. Just go into the dairy section of your local grocery store and you'll see most of these products. Um, sauerkraut, often also sold in the either the canned goods section or in the refrigerated section because you can buy sauerkraut fresh. Um, some benefits of probiotics. It can help prevent diarrhea. It can ease symptoms of irritable bowel syndrome. It can help prevent stomach aches, uh, gastroenteritis. And some researchers are showing that maybe these probiotics can help slow the development of tumors, especially those in the colon. Now I'm going to say, you know, another warning is to look out for all of these supplements that are on the market nowadays. Um, as soon as some research comes out, then some product will follow. Go for the, the probiotics that are in food that seems to be more beneficial than those through supplements. Because whether you, you are aware of this or not, a lot of supplements have no research backing behind them because they're not regulated as either drugs or as foods. So it's buyer beware when it comes to supplements and some of these advertised goods and lots of different things that you might encounter on a daily basis. Just look at advertisements. So some ways to preserve probiotics, so for example, with your yogurt or sour cream or those sorts of products, be sure that you keep dairy products refrigerated. And <clears throat> I'll ask you another question. Into the um, chat box, if you want to go ahead and type, what temperature should your refrigerator keep food in degrees Fahrenheit? What, what temperature should your fridge be? Yes, very good. Less than 40 is a good answer. And while I looked, I saw someone else had a comment. Uh, Sheila is asking, when looking at the excess salt from sauerkraut, does it still contain uh, 
valuable amount of gut biotics. Um, yes, yes, it will. Those would be contained within the, you know, the kraut itself. But certainly you want to, you do want to rinse it off or take some of that liquid off because it's very high in salt. So very good comment. Um, back to our probiotics, you want to look for food products with colony forming units of 5 to 10 million. That's how they count them in the microbiology lab for any of you who remember taking those and using petri plates and that sort of thing. And then also talk to your doctor about taking probiotics to prevent diarrhea in case you're ever on antibiotics. Sometimes there can be interactions between calcium and the antibiotic. So that's a doctor or pharmacist type of question to be aware of any food and drug interactions. Uh, we just completed some, um, we have some resources for you if you're ever interested. We have a website called Nourishing Boomers and Beyond. And that has one section about knowing your medications. And there's some information, more information for you about um, food drug interactions. And there's also a section on that website about digestion. So just another resource for you. We have a lot of things on our website, so you take, take some time to explore that. On the other hand, we also have uh, an item called prebiotics. Pre means before, so before life. And basically, this is the food for good bacteria to grow. So here, I've got my dietitian hat on. I'm telling you that try to eat a wide variety of foods because we want to get all the nutrition we need, but we also want to feed those good bacteria. And some prebiotic sources, food sources, include raisins and plums and wheat and beans, as in dryable beans, like kidney beans and pinto beans, onions, garlic, leeks. So all those are very good for us, and they're, they feed this gut bacteria. And some additional benefits can help with your mineral absorption, again, promote a healthy immune system, and may even reduce risk of food allergies. So lots of benefits with probiotics and the food for the probiotics, which are called prebiotics. So we're really starting to learn more in the world of nutrition just about the role of microorganisms in our food as well as in our body. So where do you find all these? If this were an interactive slide, <laughs> I would, these wouldn't, the little arrows wouldn't be here already. But you can see, you can find them in all the different food groups. And this, of course, is the Choose My Plate icon, which is the icon for healthy nutrition at the moment. And you know, go for a wide variety of foods, all the food groups. Best advice is moderation and variety and balance. So in some cases, probiotic therapy, so having some of these fermented foods, can help you manage diarrhea, um, irritable bowel syndrome, inflammatory bowel disease, and even cancer, as well as gastroenteritis. So there's a lot of potential health benefits. And again, it's the subject of current research. And always a good idea if you are suffering from any of these things, discuss that with your physician. Don't hold it in and don't, you know, not tell them when you go in for a checkup because there might be other things going on. So always, always keep notes. So going back to fermentation and some of its benefits, um, with fermentation there actually is a reduced need for refrigeration, but to maintain that level of those organisms you do want to keep it refrigerated as much as possible. So by lowering the acidity, so we get it more acidic, um, lowering the pH, I should say, we are preserving it. And we also are reducing potential cooking time. In some cases, we can say that fermented meat and fish do not require cooking. Um, Tempe requires less cooking time than raw soybeans. So, you know, again, when we when we add or when we change that acidity, we are changing the safety of the food. 
And finally, there's some definite flavor benefits. We can see strong, compelling flavors created. Sometimes we don't like those flavors right away, and we might take a while to adjust to, to those flavors. But it only takes a little bit of some of these enhanced foods through fermentation to help with bland foods, just adding a little bit of soy sauce or whatever it happens to be. With that, I'm going to pass it over for our little case study on sourdough. Right, thank you, Julie. Yeah. Uh, this particular slide is, is, I'm not going to go through every little thing, but this is um, one of the extension bullets that Julie and Ron Smith had put together. It's FN-433. Uh, so if you want that, just go to the, the NDSU uh, extension website. Uh, and what I'd like to do then is kind of pull apart this, this bulletin for you a little bit. And then um, just kind of cover the basics of, of sauerkraut fermentation. We won't cover every detail of it, but again, you can take a look at that uh, bulletin that was put together. There's a few things to remember with, with making sauerkraut, and it, it's best to use uh, the, the firm uh, head uh, and preferably disease-free. Um, you know, we have that discussion a little bit earlier about the, the black rot. So it's, it's a case where we prefer to have um, a very firm head, disease-free. Uh, keep in mind that if, if it's like half of the, the head is rotten, we can't take that rotten part of it and make it into something edible like sauerkraut. That, that's not going to work very well. Um, Julie had given us uh, discussion points earlier about hide and some other things, and, and that might work, um, but when it comes to, to um, a, a fermentation like a head of le uh, cabbage, it, it's not going to work very well. So we can't take the spoiled material and, and convert it into something that, that's edible. Um, but with regards to some of the, uh, like the black rot, you, you, we'd have to do experiments to really reaffirm that. Also, the reason why we want firm heads is because, remember, as this material is fermenting, it softens. It gets soft. And, and Julie had talked a little bit about some of the, the changes that occur uh, during fermentation. So if you have a firm head going in, you're going to have a little bit firmer sauerkraut coming out after that process. So that's why we want to use uh, firm heads. Uh, another important thing to, to remember is that you want to use canning or pickling salt. Um, I've done some uh, experiments where I've used regular table salt that has iodine in it, and one, the fermentation did not occur very well. I mean, it wasn't as robust as when I would use pickling salt, but also it had a little brown tint to it. So there's a the brownish tint probably came from some of the iodine during that fermentation process, um, solubilizing and, and attaching to some of the, the, the cabbage. So again, it's important to use, again, the firm head and, and pickling uh, salt for this fermentation. Uh, a general rule, if you have a lot of cabbage, 25 pounds of cabbage, you would use about three-fourths of a cup of, of salt. Okay, so that's the kind of that, that ratio that's uh, important to maintain. If you have 100 pounds, uh, keep in mind with 100 pounds, maintain this ratio. That's really the, the critical, critical part to this, uh, to making sauerkraut. Uh, just a few steps, and we'll quickly go through these. Uh, remember to prepare the cabbage. Uh, discard the, the outer leaves. Uh, and the reason why you want to do this is that many of the spoilage organisms, the things that cause spoilage in a lot of our, our produce, are sitting out in the outer edges of, of that product. And so if we discard those, we get rid of a lot of those uh, spoilage organisms that might be floating around in the air. Uh, rinse with cold water and then drain. It's important to remember not to use detergents. So you don't want to use detergents because that can be taken up in the cells of the cabbage. You end up then with, with a very soapy, sour um, 
not in a good way sauerkraut, okay? So it's from that, that soap. So it's not a good thing to do. Also, you don't want to sit there with a, a, a brush and just scrub that, that cabbage. Um, one of the things is, is that with these organisms, they're on the surface of these leaves. And so if you are, are scrubbing that away, you're getting rid of some of those good lactic acid bacteria that are present naturally. And so the fermentation may not be as robust. So if you wash it in, in cold water and then drain it. Um, draining is also important because, remember, we want to maintain that ratio of, of, of cabbage to salt. So if we have extra water there, there could be a dilution of that salt. And so therefore, you might not achieve the um, sufficient fermentation quickly enough that it would knock out some of the unwanted organisms. So those are just some general hints uh, with regard to cabbage preparation. And then also, uh, you, you want to really cut this head into small uh, slices or shreds, about a, the thickness of a quarter. Remember surface area. As we increase the surface area, we get a better fermentation. Uh, the reason for that is we press out, it's easier to press out the, the juice or the liquid from those leaves. And as a result, the uh, sugars that are in that, that leaf with the water is then used for the fermentation process. So it's easier to, to remove this water from a thin slice versus something that's thick. Um, and then also you would have, a, make sure you have a suitable fermentation uh, container. So once you have your cabbage prepped, uh, make sure you have uh, clean hands. Uh, for this next part, it's important that as you're handling this, if you don't use your hands and you have a clean utensil, that works just as well. But the important thing to remember is that for every five pounds of cabbage, use three tablespoons of salt. And so that's, that's important. And then mix that thoroughly, all right? So you want to make sure you, you disperse that salt throughout that, that cabbage material. Once that's done, remember that if you pack it into a container, so if you're only going to make five pounds, pack that firmly into a container. Remember that the salt is there for the purpose of drying out juices from that cabbage. And so the thinner that slice, the easier it is to do that. Uh, and again, uh, the idea with a lot of these fermentations is that you want to have something that helps pull out the sugars along with that water because it's the sugars that uh, the microorganisms will use in this fermentation process. If you're making a lot of sauerkraut, it's oftentimes easier just to do it in small five pound batches following that ratio and then using a larger container to dump all the the repeated shredding and salting and mixing that you might have to do. So if you have 100 pounds of, of cabbage and you add your appropriate amount of salt, it's really hard to mix that. And so it's just easier to have smaller uh, batch sizes. But it's important, again, to maintain that ratio. And so as you repeat this shredding and salting, make sure, you again, you, you pack it tightly into that container that you will be using. And then finally, you want to make sure that you have about four to five inches above that cabbage because um, you'll need to make sure that you have liquid above that, that cabbage, uh, but also you're going to need something to kind of provide a little bit of weight to that cabbage so the, the, the cabbage is not floating around in that solution. You want all the cabbage to be underneath that, that liquid layer. Uh, what are suitable containers? Well, you can use a, a gallon container for every five pounds of, of cabbage. So that's a kind of a general rule. Uh, you know, a five gallon uh, stone crock has been a traditional method for a lot of people to make sauerkraut um, because you can ferment about 25 pounds of, of cabbage, fresh cabbage. Um, but a lot more people have been going to food grade plastic containers or glass containers uh, just because they don't have a stone crock. 
um, and, but those are those are acceptable materials. Uh, the one thing that I do want to caution you about is that you want to make sure that it's food grade material. You don't want to be using a, a garbage bag or a trash liner. Uh, these are not food grade materials, and so they're not not good for uh, the fermentation processes. Uh, and, and so again, recognizing that um, user correct material will always lead to uh, more successful production of, of the sauerkraut. Um, in this particular case, just recognizing again that in some cases um, there's some newer systems where they have plastic containers that have fermentation locks attached to them, or you can attach a fermentation lock. Uh, so that's another type of container that, that can be used. Um, but just remember that regardless of your container, that you want to keep that cabbage one to two inches under the, the brine surface, right? So you want to maintain that under the, the brine. Uh, you also want to uh, place a, a glass dinner plate or a, a pie plate inside this container. Uh, this will help keep that cabbage from floating to the surface of that brine. Um, and you also then want to cover that container with a clean towel. So if you're not going to use a, a, a lid on your, like a five gallon bucket with a fermentation lock, make sure you cover it with a clean towel. Um, and then allow that to ferment at 70 to 75 degrees Fahrenheit for a given amount of time. And so again, it depends on, on your sauerkraut, but you know, keep an eye on it. Um, ideally, you know, I've had sauerkraut five, six weeks uh, for fermenting and it seemed to turn out all right. So again, just pay attention to the, to the, to the, the bulletin that Julie has put together. So once that, that sauerkraut has fermented for the given amount of time, it's important then that you would transfer this in a covered container in the refrigerator. And that will last about seven months. So remember that this is not a sterile product. It still has active cultures growing. Um, so you have to basically um, put that in the refrigerator. You can also freeze the product. Um, with freezing it, as long as you can prevent freezer burn, it will probably last uh, you know, upwards to, to uh, nine months to a year. Um, and then one of the more common approaches is to actually use um, hot or raw pack canning methods uh, with the idea being that you can then take that sauerkraut and put it on your shelf. So it doesn't have to be in the refrigerator, it doesn't have to be in the freezer, you can put it in the, the cupboard. Uh, so that is, that is essentially then uh, ways that you would preserve that sauerkraut at the end of that process. And again, uh, there's there's USDA processing time, so go ahead and, and if you're doing a hot pack versus a raw pack, you have pints, quarts, you have different um, processing conditions, okay? So that would be a way to help uh, determine, do you want fresh sauerkraut? If you do, then you have to refrigerate it. If you want something that can sit on, sit on the shelf and you'd pull it off in the middle of, of January, uh, you want to then do that, that canning approach. If we look at, at vegetables, it's very similar to sauerkraut in the sense of the fermentation. The, the concept's essentially the same. One of the things is that we want to increase the surface area. Always remember that the more surface area you have, the easier it will be for you to withdraw or, or uh, take out that moisture from that, that vegetable piece, right? So a thin piece. Uh, means higher surface area. That's important because you pull out the sugars, you pull out the liquid, there's more fermentation that can occur. Uh, salt, uh, by salting this, um, remember that the salt helps to pull out the water from the cells of that vegetable. And so, again, using a proper ratio of salt is very important. You know, there's, a, there's some information on the, the extension websites for this, but the idea is always remember that you have to use salt because that's what helps inhibit some of the food pathogenic organisms, but lets our lactic acid bacteria grow with no problem. Um, and then uh, the, there are some 
options for you with regards to salt. Salt's typically the preferred method. I'll admit that to me. It, it's a preferred method. Uh, it slows that fermentation process, and it, it slows enzymatic processes, especially those that affect uh, the texture. So pectin is a, a, a fiber material that if we can uh, prevent enzymes from breaking it down, it helps retain that crunchiness or crispiness in that vegetable so you get a firmer fermented product. Um, it also slows the growth of the bacteria and mold. So, so it's a, a case where you're going to have to have that product sitting there longer at room temperature, per se, than you would, say, if you have a no salt. One of the problems with no salt is it ferments in two to three days. So you have to be on the ball and be ready to do something with it. Otherwise, it's going to go from a fermented to a spoiled food very quickly. We want to add spices. And spices, remember, will inhibit molds. And then finally, we have the need for starter cultures sometimes because it's such a fast fermentation process that we want to make sure that we have the, the appropriate starter culture present. So again, when we, we look at vegetables, keep in mind it's very similar to sauerkraut, um, uh, but you, you can have options in some cases where no salt, but you have to be very careful uh, about that type of fermentation. And then you want to make sure you, you pack it. So the key here, again, is to pack it correctly. So even if you use salt or not, you still have to produce this anaerobic environment. Because remember, it's this anaerobic environment that's going to allow for the production of lactic acid. And it's this lactic acid that, that really helps preserve that product. And then fermentations, again, two to three days for, for no salt. It could be as long as a year for others. So it all depends on what vegetable, the size of that particle, et cetera that you will, uh, will be producing. And with that, I will turn it over to Julie again, and she can uh, sure. wrap up well, our thanks session. Thanks so much, Cliff, for, for joining us today. This is a book. If you're really interested in this topic, I'm looking at it on my shelf. It's about an inch thick. Uh, it's available on Amazon. I don't get any cuts or anything from it, but it's a very interesting book if you want to explore this topic. It has lots of different formulations and so on. And we are going to do some additional, or do some fermentation work at a, here at NDSU. Um, lots of references. We didn't make this up. <laughs> uh, again, I'd like to thank you for attending our session. And there is a survey at the end. And we will take, we will, uh, take some time for questions. And Anne is asking if we agree with all of Sanders' methods of fermentation. Uh, I don't know. Cliff, have you read? I, I have not explored all of them. <laughs> no, I, I have not either. I'll have to take a look and see. Yes. Yeah. You have to watch out, you know, again, with finding things online. You know, go, go with the most reputable sources, university sites. Colorado State is in the midst of getting some fermentation resources posted online. I don't think they have them up yet. But um, hopefully, maybe in the future, we'll have some additional fermentation resources. Uh, Ron Smith and I, a few years ago, along with Steve Sagasser, put together a wine making guide, which is a type of fermentation. So that is available on our site as well. But currently, the only things we have are wine making and the sauerkraut guide. Oh, OK. Anna's saying she met him and said he could use any kind of salt, even table salt. Well, I think for the reasons that Cliff told us, um, I would use canning salt. You know, you're going to get a much better product. If you use table salt in, say, pickling, you're going to get a very cloudy product as well. And it could discolor your vegetables and even give odd tastes. Any other yes, questions? Yes, and I would thoughts? agree with you, Julie, on that that salt issue. Um, I, I really think that <clears throat> that um, you know some we eat with our eyes, and so um, after I had had made that, it's been probably a decade ago that I did that experiment. 
that it, it, it wasn't something that I probably would have eaten. And so I think that, you know, to me, it's not worth the risk considering how cheap pickling salt is. Um, Ryan had great success. Yes, I grew up on a little bit German, <laughs> um, eating some sauerkraut made in a crock. I mean, basically, it isn't going to hurt you. I mean, using table salt, we all need the iodine, but all of the USDA recipes do call for canning salt. Okay, well, I think I will draw this to a close since we're a little bit over time. Thank you again. I hope that you join us next week for the session on microgreens. Thank you very much, and please take the survey.